one of the players who haven't improved neither under Julian Nagelsmann or under Tuchel. He has uh, be- become worse on the pitch. He's not delivering. <laughs> Hi and welcome to the German Fußball Podcast. I'm your host, Marcus Fjortoft, and as always, joined by Jan Fjortoft. A little bland background for you today. It's not that we've upgraded your studio or downgraded, so to speak, with the excellent one you have at home, but tell the audience where you are, maybe why we're doing it today on a Tuesday rather than on a Monday. Yeah, it was a busy day Monday for me. I, I'm in Berlin. I was here with Eintracht Frankfurt. Uh, we have a project together. And last night, the whole day last night, uh, last night we were we were using uh, our, the time uh, on our project. I will uh, come up with more about that later. But I am you now at the uh, Berliner Airport. I remember this was a scandalous airport that it took them ages to build. But now it's quite good here. I'm sitting on the on the floor um, doing the podcast today and the YouTube for your YouTube channel. And I keep myself updated on the German press. This is Bild Zeitung talking about the crisis at Dortmund. Remember, they lost 3 2 at home at Hoffenheim. Then we have Kicker. Kicker is talking, where they have this motto, me, uh, uh, they're talking about we are like sour power. Now, Kicker is asking, who are we? Uh, after the win against uh, Leipzig, things calm down a bit. Maybe we'll talk more about Max Ebel later. And then there's a big, big story. I look forward to read that. I've seen some of the headlines in the Spiegel. The Spiegel got a big story about Julian Nagelsmann. And I think we can start there, Marcus, because it's, it's funny now with, with Tuchel, they agreed. We, we made an... an uh, an episode talking about everything in and around Tuchel. But the thing is now, of course, their main candidate is Sabi Alonso. But Sabi Alonso is so intelligent that he won't give anything away, which means that there would be a great space for all kinds of speculation. So all kind of coaches, managers are linked with Bayern at the moment. But the biggest surprise is that Julian Nagelsmann kind of saying between the lines that he will... He could go back to Bayern. So imagine that. One year ago, he got fired for Salah Hamisic and Khan. Now Khan and Salah Hamisic are fired. And now Tuchel, who took over for him, is, well, fired, leaving in the summer. And Julian Nagelsmann could come back. So the FC Hollywood sometimes is a cliche, but I think we have to use it because they're kind of delivering all the time. Well, there are... Two aspects to it as well. On on one hand, and we discussed it on a couple of episodes ago, is the question whether Nagelsmann's time at Bayern is redeemed by how poorly Tuchel's time has been. Because remember, Nagelsmann got fired after losing three games the entire season. They were in the running for all three tournaments and they brought Tuchel in to see how many they could go for and how the tides have changed. But coming into this now and this consideration, last season... There was Oliver Khan, there was Hassan, uh, Hassan Hassan Hamidic, there was all that going on. They're out. We have Max Erbo now, responsible for sporting operations, coming starting the 1st of March. We have Christoph Freund, who started about half a year ago. It's a new era on the on the on the horizon for 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 Bayern Dad. And would it then be that surprising that Nagusman would be in contention? Special look at the candidates. And if you go all in for Sab Alonso and they don't get him, well, then what? Maybe he is the most suitable candidate. I don't know. It would be, it would be certainly be consistent with the FC Hollywood narrative, but maybe it's not as surprising as we think. I don't know if you have anything more to kind of elaborate on the matter. Well, I think they're making themselves the space in the media about it because they're saying it's all about the two who, who kicked him out, they're out, and we didn't know about it. The rest of the boys as Bayern is saying. But as we're speaking now, Marcus, in one hour time, there will be a presentation of Max Ebel uh, at the press conference. So he will start the 1st of March working for Bayern. But, but of course, he's been working with them, talking to them, making plans together with him. So is everything open to do that? I think that the problem is with Julian Nagelsmann. 
it, it was like they, they fired him like in the habit of firing coaches because when, when you look at Bayern at the moment, it's a long-term project, in, but you have to win football games as you plan your long-term project as well. So there's a lot of players now that you can say Kimmich and Goretzka, they haven't improved with Tuchel, but hey, they didn't improve with Newell and Nagelsmann either. So you, you have to have a change of, of generations, more or less. Now with Müller on his way out, Neuer is on his way out, you need new leaders. You need young kids coming up like Musiala, Pavlovich. There's a lot of things go, going on there. So the funny thing is that who will fit that profile best is Julian Nagelsmann. So, so that could happen. Uh, Max Ebel will now come in as a head of sport, meaning that uh, they will make an executive board of three people. That will be Dresden, who is the CEO of Bayern. So he's the leader of Bayern, the official leader of Bayern. Then you have the leader of sport, which will be Max Ebel. And then you have of finance and commercials, uh, Dietrich, who will also sit in this three-man executive board. Then you can ask yourself, what will happen to Freund, who just uh, arrived from Salzburg? And I think that is a very good question. Um, will he be happy to kind of sit on the bench, uh, be responsible for young kids coming into the squad? I'm not sure about that. But just let's see now what what happening. Max Ebel, former player at Bayern, uh, has been in Gladbach for many years, Leipzig, of course, then he's been out for a while, and now he's destined to take this job for many years, and now he's there as head of sport. Let's put it this way, Marcus. They put himself... In a, in a way, and as I read in the media as well now, they're creating a space for also taking back Julian Nagelsmann. They, they, they are looking for, for the best man, and we'll see who the alternatives will be to Sarri Alonso. And in terms of that new era, there are players that will go out, players that go in. Christoph Freund, renowned for bringing younger players in, especially Red Bull Salzburg. Um, while you have to maintain that core of players, so the one one hander remains. Well, who will be the the players who are there in the current squad who will lead this new uh, kind of era for Bayern Munich? Now, a player that has very much been rumored to leave, and um, as reported by the Athletic uh, a couple of days ago, is that Alfonso Davis has verbally agreed with Real Madrid. Now, Christo, um, Christian Falk, podcast friend, Bayern insider, said that there's nothing been agreed, but that the fact that Davis has expressed a willingness to go to Real Madrid is certainly there. What can we take from that? Obviously, his contract is expiring in 2025. So there's the question if they buy him out in 2024 or if they wait for him to be go on, on a free in 2025. But you've, you've mentioned it on the podcast, especially this season, that Alfonso Davis was incredible. Arguably one of the best fullbacks in the world, especially during that treble winning season for Bayern. But lately, been going a bit down. Meanwhile, his wage demands have been going a bit up. So it seems like a bit of a friction there between what Alfonso Davis wants and what Bayern seem to want. The pitch. He's not delivering his, uh, his fantastic overlaps on the left side. I mean, it was a part of the uh, well, the force behind the titles that, as you were saying, Bayern Munich won. But uh, the, the update on that is that Christoph Freund had a meeting in Sebenerstrasse. That's is where Bayern trained. The, uh, a meeting with them and they were not told that that's the more or less official report. They were not told that he was leaving for Bayern uh, not leaving for Real Madrid and leaving Bayern. But I think that if Real Madrid wants Alfonso Davis, they will get Alfonso Davis. Remember, Bayern have spent a lot of money. Bayern need to sell players as well. The problem is with Alfonso Davis, does that fit in that development of a younger team he would be perfect wouldn't he with with a, with, a, with his left foot with his with his speed with his force but this season he hasn't been that good and and we could see alfonso davis going they can't go into a, a last season of him maybe be free uh, and get nothing from him that too many players who have left by in the last years that they have got no money and they need more money to invest because Whoever will take over uh, after Tuchel in the summer, you, you need uh, the, the, he will have demands uh, demands of getting other players in. And just related to this, but obviously separate, Alfonso Davis's story is pretty incredible for those who have been heard in terms of uh, leaving Liberia, a war torn country, 
yeah. you know, being in a refugee camp and then getting into Canada and working himself up through there. So the fact that he might end up, well, the fact that they end up at Bayern and then Real Madrid would be a Hollywood-like story. Dad, uh, going forward, we could just touch upon them a bit. You've been with Eintracht, but Dad, what is going on with Eintracht Frankfurt at the moment? I think after Glasner, when Glasner left, you've got in Dino Tutmula, a young, experienced, inexperienced manager. It was all about not getting a revolution. It was getting an evolution. And they sold uh, Moani just before the, before the season started. They had a lot of money. And it kind of steadied the ship. And the funny thing is, if you look at Bayern, uh, sorry, at Eintracht Frankfurt at the moment, on the table, it's not looking bad. They're in the sixth position. But 2024 have been terrible for them. And now against Wolfsburg, they were 1 0 down. They were 1 2 down. And then Marmush, getting his 15th goal of the season, saved them. But the, the, the thing that it's not working properly at, um, at Frankfurt at the moment. I think the, the main problem for them, I don't think there is anything uh, uh, between the team and, 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 the, and the manager uh, because they show great attitude coming back from 1 2 and 1 0 1. Uh, against Wolfsburg, who is also in a crisis with Niko Kovac as a former uh, Eintracht coach uh, coming back. But the problem with Dino Topmuller and Eintracht Frankfurt at the moment is I can't see what they try to do. I can't see the way of playing. They, I think I think the idea after Glasner and Hütter was that this um, high-speed, high-intensity uh, intensity kind of game, they should keep the ball more more but you know Marcus the problem is when you want to keep the ball more it's it's fine when it's running but it's, if it's not working well you're just standing there passing to each other I've seen lots of the games for Eintracht Frankfurt and they're just ending up passing without the purpose it seems so so bad time for Dino uh, Chapmuller and Eintracht Frankfurt a big test for him they're out of Europe they're out of uh, the cup uh, which, which they have also had good traditions uh, the last season so it's all about getting into Europe if he managed to steady the ship into Europe that's fine uh, if not uh, it's close to a failure for him and from one manager to another albeit this manager being on more shaky ground more shaky foundations than Tino Topmuller certainly is and that is Edin Terzic that you mentioned in the intro there in terms of there being question marks related to Edin Terzic's performance Dortmund's performance and again, we find ourselves in the same rut in terms of what is Dortmund? What do they want to accomplish? And it seems like things are being drawn to their natural conclusion in terms of Terrace's tenure. Having said that, his position within Dortmund is strong in terms of his relationship, etc. But where do Dortmund go for now? They lost at the weekend 3-2 to Hoffenheim at home, Maximilian Bayer, the very talented center forward who's in contention for the Euro scoring two, but... It's not a good enough for Dortmund. And yes, you can blame it on individual mistakes, but this is, seems to be the Dortmund DNA. Absolutely. And I think that uh, there is a fashion now of managers saying that they will go in the summer. We know Tuchel, we know Xavi. We, we do think that that win for, for Bayern against Leipzig was very important. The, two goals from Kane in the last minutes, they say. And somehow that saved that process they have planned to have Tuchel there till the summer. I'm, I won't be surprised if we will have an uh, announcement soon about Dortmund that Edin Terzic will leave them in the summer. Uh, because Edin Terzic is, is, is a bit the same to Dino Tupmler. How does he want to play? And they have a, a team that should be in the Champions League. They are in the Champions League. They go 1 1 at PSV. They will probably go to the quarterfinal. That's a paradox. So they won't be happening anything before there is an end game in the Champions League. Uh, the advantage for Terzic is that, that he is protected by Vatske. Vatske is, is one of us and Edin Terzic being a fan of Dortmund. And, and of course, the patience with him is, is more than you have um, a just a common coach who, who was at the club. So he is on, uh, as you were saying, on a, on a loose ground, Edin Terzic. He needs to win football games. But as he is still in the Champions League, I uh, remember a terrible penalty decision made him 1-1 at PSV. Hummels wasn't even close to a penalty. Uh, so I think you have to see a conclusion on their uh, Champions League adventure before, adventure before something will happen in Dortmund. But bad, bad result for them this weekend against uh, Hoffenheim. 
Yeah, it was um, big mistakes by Merchan already early on and the captain. I'm talking that... about talking about mistakes, Mark. Is that, yeah, you're talking about Emre Can, and he was saying that, that the mistakes, I, I I thought that was a great bridge over to Leverkusen because Leverkusen now have what the, in Germany they call a Bayern Dusel. They have the luck of the great teams. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt you with, with, with Dortmund, but I, with, with Bo Henriksen, they've got an, another boo at Mainz that won at Augsburg, and they did quite good against Leverkusen. At 1-1, they had a great chance as well. But then at the end of the day, there was a big goalkeeper mistake, and Leverkusen won again. They did. Uh, Andrich long shot. Sentner was, had made some incredible saves, but then was able to somehow mess that long shot up 2-1 Leverkusen, who uh, keep their eight-point uh, gap. I was saying with Emre Can thing is part of the criticism of Terzic is this is a player that Terzic really endorsed. He called, he gave, made him captain. He he vetoed the the transfer of Alvarez from Ajax because he said, "No, I have Emre Can." Etc. It's these small little decisions that are leading to the criticism of Edin Terzic. That I just want to touch upon some uh, topics. Well, let me go first through the games. Augsburg shouldn't we? Win. Shouldn't we? Shouldn't we end Leverkusen? Shouldn't we end it, Leverkusen, with your friend uh, Shaka with uh, the best <laughs> goals? The true, best true, goals true. Have... We're so used to praising Leverkusen that I, I kind of, uh, yeah. But true. Yeah. I mean, what a spectacular goal that. I mean, I said it on Twitter as well. Like, I cannot think of a more spectacular, like a better feeling than that goal right there. Just this, oh, just that the kind of a boomerang banana kind of effect over Zentner. Incredible. And the celebrations too. And for those who didn't see it, I mean, uh, check it out. He he um, he, you, uh, he showed that he was injured. He did his hamstring. I thought it straight away. I saw the game live and oh, live on TV. And I was thinking, wow, that is a bad thing for, for, for Leverkusen. Maybe the most important players when you see it, everything. And, and you saw on the bench, you saw the staff of Alonso getting worried. <laughs> and then Alonso told him after, I think he took him two, three seconds as well to, to see it. And I calmed down. Uh, he's only joking. And I, I, I th there were some people saying that that was not good. I think it was brilliant. And it just shows you as well. And I think that is a good sign for Leverkusen that they have that kind of joke. They have that kind of togetherness in the team, having fun. Because, yes, they're eight points ahead of Bayern. They are all have also a better goal difference. But it's still <laughs> the neutral thing. Bayern will find some way to win the Bundesliga after 11 times in a row. Um, so, But now we're coming to that stage of the season is for Leverkusen to lose. If Leverkusen now should fail to win the league, this will go into the history of the Bundesliga, that one of the most biggest collapse of... of and of course, Leverkusen, Simon Rolf, Abi Alonso, they know about that. But a big, big compliment, a big, big compliment to Alonso, keeping his head Calm. He will be now linked to Liverpool, will be linked to Bayern. But Alonso, he's so intelligent, he's so smart that he doesn't give anything away. And the way he kind of neutralized every question about it in press conference without doing too much, without doing like a lot of coaches do. No, 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 no. I, w I won't talk about it. I won't talk about it. No, it's just, no, no, no. I, I don't want to talk about that. I wanna, I'm here to talk about Leverkusen. So I think the way he is doing it is brilliant. And people should be aware of all news about Alonso wants this, Alonso wants that. That is simply not true. He is too intelligent to give any clues what he's doing. I think, and I've said that before, and I said that on Twitter many times, as it stands now, Alonso will be at Leverkusen next season. And remember, Angelotti's contract is up in 2025, next summer. The, the Real Madrid job will be ready for him as well. And then the alternative would be, should I go to Liverpool after Klopp? Whoever will go there, we saw at the League Cup final, wow, that is leadership of the highest level. Or should I go to FC Hollywood now? Uh, or should I wait for Real Madrid and stay at Leverkusen and see how far I can get in the Champions League? To be continued. To be continued, in, indeed. It will be in a very exciting summer. Uh, yeah, I was just concluding the, the the other games in terms of Augsburg turning around against Freiburg. Augsburg, again, impressive in terms of the way they did it. Köln equalized late at Stuttgart, which was surprising. Uh, Bremen and Darmstadt shared the points after some VAR drama. Towards the very end, Darmstadt thought they had won it. 
by all accounts, they did. And then it was called out for handball. And then Gladbach with a big win against Bochum, which gave, gave them some kind of gap to the to the teams in the bottom. And then Union Berlin and Heidium shared the spoils 2-2. Two, two. Um, just some small little uh, things to touch upon. We have Toni Kroos, who is back for the German national team ahead of the Euros. Some thoughts on that, Dad, in terms of what he could bring. He said himself, he's hardly the saviour, but maybe a vital clog in the machine, so to speak. The German national team has underachieved now in two World Cups. Uh, they have then players out, like Toni Kroos. He said, that I don't want to play. I want to concentrate on Real Madrid. He is still doing his job there. They will win La Liga this season with Manchester City, the favourite to get into the Champions League. I have talked to different people in Germany who says, no, this is not the start. Is this a new start to the German national team? But for me, it's diff different. For me, it's very clear that get Tony Cruz back can only be good for, for Germany because they are down. They need someone in there who can kind of be the uh, editor, the producer in midfield, the balanced player. And Tony Cruz, best around, also great attitude. So with him and Gundogan, Musiala, well, we're starting to have a quite good midfield in terms of names, anyway. And Julian Nagelsmann also said, was very clear that from now on, Joshua Kimmich will be my right back. Uh, and we saw also this week, and he played for Bayern at the right back position against Leipzig. So, so the German national team are getting better players back. They're getting a structure. The, we, we have some national games coming up in two, three weeks. It's going to be interesting what Julian Nagelsmann is doing as will he have all players available because certainly, and I, and I speak here from Germany now, the Euros, we know that as a event maker, they will do it brilliantly. There will be a great, great championship. But, of course, they, they don't want to be embarrassed through a bad performance of the German national team. So getting Tony Cruz back is a big, big step for them. And just a couple of uh, last talking points. We have to also, I think this really deserves its own separate episode, Dad, but it is pretty remarkable that the investor deal, the strategic investment partnership deal, call it what you may, that the DFL were going to do, bringing in private equi equity, bringing in external sources, so to speak, to grow the league simply because of the 51 plus one rule. Clubs can't do it themselves. They backed out of it, which is rather, which is pretty incredible considering. The fact that we live in a world now where you tend to see that, yes, you have fans and yes, and but their influence is limited, so to speak, because there are certain other financial considerations. That's simply how it is because clubs, federations, organizations, they are businesses. But through the sheer force of fan protests across the board, Vatske, who is the main spokesperson and leader of this of, of, the, of the DFL, they backed out of it. And I think we don't have, there's a lot to discuss in it, but it needs to be said that it's pretty remarkable that something as grassroots democratic as that can win through in this kind of day of age, especially within football. I got an ambivalent uh, relation to this whole thing. I'm, I am, I'm not sure how important that investor was because I, I just understand that the people who are running the football say that to be competitive in international business, they need more money in. So they find they have to find a way, and they, they wanted to get uh, investors in to have the commercial rights uh, of of football in, in Germany. Then on the other side, you have the the voice of the fans, uh, which is very important because they are so important uh, stakeholders in our industry. Then they want it through kind of stop football games. I don't like that. I don't like the the actions in and around football because first of all you can't say that the people in the stadium represent all fans in the world maybe maybe all fans in germany are against investor fair enough but they have a right for their opinion they have a right to be heard absolutely but i've still got an ambivalent feeling of seeing every game in the bundesliga uh, been stopped on the other hand there is a great win for that view, and that is fair. I respect that. But I think also the worry now is what, what will the next thing that the, the fans will do? I'm not saying that is a worry that they should be heard, because I think they are the most important voice of them all. 
but we can we had the same now with with the Frankfurt fan. They stopped the game. For, I don't. I'm not sure. Hundred percent sure how, for how long that was against Wolfsburg, uh, because you know you have some teams: Wolfsburg, Hoffenheim, Leverkusen, uh, Leipzig, who are kind of in quote uh, uh, private owned. So how far this will be? I uh, hopefully now the. Um, the governing bodies of German football together with the fans can create a platform where these kind of things can be avoided and also avoided that the fans need to be heard so we don't we don't have to come to, to a stage when, when games are cancelled because I don't think that is good for the viewers, it's not good for the fans and it's not good for the product called football. Yeah, and that was part of the consideration that Vasca said. It was putting match operations, specific matches, and thus the integrity of the competition at, at risk. So there was that acknowledgement. Dad, before we conclude, it there have been some days passed, but World Cup hero Andreas Breme passed away. Now we will have a varying demographic, varying ages of our audience, but just put into context who Andreas Breme is and why we are mentioning him in this in this podcast in the light of everything else we discussed. Well, he's six, seven years older than me, so I just feel he's a bit uh, a generation over me. But but still, I played against him uh, in the Europa Cup uh, back in the beginning of the 90s. Andreas Bremer, Jürgen Klinsmann and Lothar Matthäus played for Inter. They were the superstars. They won the UEFA Cup. They knocked us out. I will always say that there was a referee in, in Italy who did it, uh, and it did. But Andreas Bremer was a left-back, a right-back. Uh, there is a the great story about him when he did, did penalties, you never knew if he would do left foot or right foot. And he has gone with both feet, so he was two footed. Uh, will, he will go now into um, the memory of all football fans around the world about the World Cup in 1990, three, four minutes before the end, uh, Germany against uh, Argentina. Rudy Fowler is foul. The, the penalty taker should be Lota Mateus. And Lothar Matthäus uh, had a bit cold feet, or he told Andreas Bremer, you can take it. And so you're standing there, uh, you know that this, this kick is, is for eternity. You can be a World Cup champion. And, and Bremer told the story that when he was standing there with the ball, Rudy Fuller came over to him and said, you know, if you score now, we will win the World Cup. So like, thank you, mate, put me under pressure. And the story is also... They just described him was that nobody knew would he shoot with his left foot or his right foot because he was two foot and he came of course in and did with, the, with his right foot and him uh, Mario Götze who scored a winner G Gert Müller who scored a winner when they won uh, in one in seventy four he's a, a man for the eternity I've had a pleasure to meet Andreas Bremer when I've been working in Germany a humble man the nicest man around, one, just one of the good guys. And uh, it was very sad when he, he passed away and he will be remembered but as one of the greatest football players that this country has ever created, world champion, uh, and, and just a great, great lad. And I, I can't see how it's possible to have a greater and better legacy than that. Thank you, Dad, for that. A fitting tribute for a footballing a legend that I know you have a flight to catch sooner or later, but it was been a pleasure uh, from your little uh, improvised studio from Berlin Airport. We will be reconvening, obviously, next week on the Monday to discuss all the different happenings and going into the summer as well, which will be busy seen from uh, a German football lens. But for now, Dad, thanks a lot. Thank you. And now you're here. My <laughs> flight is ready to go. Time's perfect timing. Perfect. <laughs> timing is everything. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. Ciao. Ciao.